It was a little over 15 years ago when Jake Burton and Tom Sims had this crazy notion to jump on a fat single ski and ride sideways down the slopes of Vermont, ushering in the new sport of snowboarding. Hello everyone, I'm Sandy Santucci and today snowboarding is the fastest growing winter sport enticing many major ski resorts to build special parks and areas for the riders to enjoy. It's estimated that in the next five years, half of all the lift tickets sold will be to snowboarders. And this growth has prompted the development of the International Snowboard Federation. The ISF is currently recognized in over 25 countries on three continents and serves as the governing body for over 250 amateur and professional snowboard races. This year's ISF World Tour had four stops in North America. In the next hour, we'll recap the highlights from competitions held in Mount Hood, Oregon, in Canada's Mount St. Anne, and at the infamous Hunter Mountain Ski Resort just outside of New York City. Our final stop is the United States Amateur Snowboarding Association Championships at Sierra at Tahoe. <laughs> sport of snowboarding continues to grow, it's imperative that organizations such as the ISF and the USASA are able to grow and prosper. By organizing competitions, these associations promote the growth for this new competitive sport of snowboarding, enabling these young athletes a venue to vent their competitive spirit. So don't go away, we'll be right back with the first stop on the ISF North American World Pro Tour from Mount Hood, Oregon. Welcome back. With four of the European events already completed, the first North American stop on the Ballantine's ISF World Pro Tour is in Oregon's Mount Hood Meadows Ski Resort. Unfortunately, there was a conflict in scheduling with the European Championships, and many of the top European riders didn't make the journey to the Pacific Northwest. However, that opened up the doors for the young American riders to collect top points. The Pacific Northwest is most famous for its fantastic windsurfing in the summer, and it's only natural that snowboarding caught on fast with the locals. Nestled on the northwest side of Mount Hood, only 67 miles from downtown Portland, Mount Hood Meadows is a winter playground for all to enjoy. Boasting an annual snowfall of over 200 inches, this 2,000 acre ski area serves as a mecca for skiers and snowboarders. Let's profile some of the top riders at this year's Wide Open Challenge. First up is Mount Hood local Mike Jacoby. Jacoby is here to defend his Super G title that he won last year. From Salem, Oregon, Shannon Melius is no stranger to World Pro Tour competition. He won last year's Mount St. Anne Super G. Mark Fawcett, also from Hood River, is another keen windsurfer and revels in other high action sports such as mountain biking and rock climbing. Nelson Jensen, out of Abbott's Ford in Canada, a powerful rider who's made an impact on the U.S. Tour, finishing third in GS at the 93 U.S. Nationals. Michelle Taggart, one of the strongest all-round women competitors on the circuit. In 93, she won the overall title at the World Championships. Tara Masterpool from Reno, Nevada, finished third in GS last year in both the ISF World Pro Tour and the World Championships. Stacia Hookham, a young aspiring competitor, already showing her form by taking second place at this year's Amateur World Championships. Another amateur, Jennifer Shirowski from Edwards, Colorado, the top place finisher at the Sugarloaf Open. Let's pick up the competition with Michelle Taggart on course, riding a fast track as she carves a perfect line around the wide roundhouse turn. 
Michelle's a powerful rider who likes to keep a low profile through the turns on the flat sections. She has some difficulty with the ruts, causing her to lose speed and get light over the knoll, losing her critical edge. She slides out and falls. But with a quick recovery, she's back on her feet and approaches the finish. Michelle passes the finish line with a time of 144.43. Pretty impressive for having a fall on the steeps. On course now from Edwards, Colorado, Stacia Hookham is having a blazing run as she holds a tight line through the critical roundhouse turn. As she approaches the flats, a round line helps Stacia maintain her speed through the ruts of the flat section as she approaches the knoll. She had a little trouble setting up for the air bump, having made a double turn just before the knoll, causing her to get sideways. Precious seconds ticked away before she was able to recover and complete her run with a time of 133.44. Let's watch Tara Masterpool get a little air before she enters the tough roundhouse turn. Tara rips through the turn and is carrying a ton of speed into the flat section. Like Hookham, Tara takes the round line, allowing her to cross the ruts without any trouble as she approaches the knoll. Not having to scrub any speed through the flats, Masterpool carved over the knoll, staying on her line as she nears the finish. Crossing the finish line with a time of 132.82. She takes the lead from Hookham, and it was an impressive win for Tara, as she did not allow the poor course conditions to affect her riding. And as we look at the spectators anxiously awaiting the men's competition. Up first for the men will be Jeremy Jones from Vermont, Jeremy prefers the technical events of Slam and GS, but today he appears to be a speed specialist as he cars beautiful turns through the flats. Negotiating the round turns, Jones is setting up for the knoll and the steep pitch before the finish. Carrying too much speed into the air bump, making him turn sideways in the air, landing out of his line. He comes to almost a complete stop before the finish, but he gets back on track as he approaches the finish and crosses with a disappointing time of 126.19. Into the roundhouse turn now is local favorite Mike Jacoby, making a sweet line through the roundhouse turn, carrying tremendous speed towards the flats. Oh no, he leads into the hill a little too much and finds himself crashing into the fence. He's losing precious time and after digging himself out, he gets back on course. And as we watch Mike, try to pick up some more speed as he heads into the knoll and down into the steeps. He's gonna try to streak into the finish line, but he's lost valuable time due to that crash. And he's gonna cross that finish line with an impressive time of 132.32, placing him in the top 10. And next on course is John Percy. He likes the Super G and has little trouble negotiating through the roundhouse turn through that transition and onto the flats. Let's see if he can keep his speed up as he heads for that steep section just after the knoll. Well, the ruts seem to be growing, causing John to have some problems on the steep section. And it looks like he'll finish with a time of 125.21 to take over the lead. And as the spectators wait in anticipation, our next rider, Shannon Melius, hailing from Salem, Oregon. Melius is comfortable with this Mount Hood snow as he tears through the roundhouse turn and onto the flats. Choosing the tight line, Shannon screams across the flats towards the knoll. Melius rode a quiet line over the knoll and flies down the steeps to the finish area, crossing with a time of 124.36, stealing the lead from John Percy. All right, up next will be Canada's Nelson Jensen. And let's see him. He's smoking through the roundhouse turn and into the transition. He's not letting those bumps and ruts throw him as he approaches the knoll with deceptive speed. Over the knoll, Nelson chooses a round line down the steep and drops into a tuck as he approaches the finish. And he crosses the finish with an impressive 124.60, giving him a lock on second place. And as we watch the crowd, let's take a look at the final women's results. First place is Tara Masterpool, followed by Stacia Hookham. And in a surprise third place finish, Rosie Fletcher. And in the men's Super G, Oregon's own Shannon Melius takes top honors, followed by Canada's Nelson Jensen, 
with John Percy taking third. <laughs> And welcome back to the Mount Hood Meadows Wide Open Challenge. And as we look down the half pipe from the start, the weather played a bit of a factor in this half pipe competition. But before we start, let's meet the top competitors. From Snowmass, Colorado, Jimmy Scott, the reigning ISF World Pro Tour half pipe champion. Keith Duckboy Wallace from Spokane, Washington, one of the most familiar faces in the free riding half pipe world. Mike Basich out of Fair Oaks, California, fourth overall in the half pipe on the ISF World Pro Tour. Jason Evans, a veritable newcomer in the pro ranks. With a competition fierce here, he'll have to pull out all the stops. Shannon Dunn from Steamboat Springs, Colorado, was second in both the ISF World Pro Tour and the World Championship. With half pipe being her strongest discipline, Michelle Taggart is one of the only girls to have the talent to take a win away from Shannon. Riding for Burton, Kara Beth Burnside learned her half pipe trick riding from years of skateboarding competition. First up for the women is Shannon Dunn, riding for Sims, coming across the upper deck as she drops into the pipe. After performing a series of backside grabs, Shannon sets up for an impressive alley-oop 360. And Shannon dances through the finish line with a score of 43.3. Dropping next in the pipe is rider Kara Beth Burnside. Having to impress the judges with two big airs, Kara Beth went up on the deck to get more speed for a big air fakie. <laughs> Kara finishes with a solid run and a score of 44.8 points. At the top now is amateur Jana Mayan. She drops in, performs a big front side air. Let's watch this newcomer in the half pipe. Great 360. She continues to have a solid run, throwing big air. And she's finishing strong with a backside indie, followed by a 360. Jana Mayan finishing with a score of 47.2. Good run for the amateur. For the, for the men's final now. All right, let's head over to the men's side of the competition. And first up from Snowmass, Colorado, is reigning ISF champion Jimmy Scott. Jimmy Scott, no stranger to half pipe competition. He is somewhat of a veteran here as he starts off strong with a couple of big hits. Jimmy is always impressing the judges right there with a 540 melon grab. He is working the pipe for all it's worth. Let's watch as Jimmy works some of his magic. Jimmy finishing with an elk aerial and a score of 58.6. Jimmy Scott, reigning ISF champion. Up next now is Sean Johnson. As he waits his turn in the start for his final run, he chooses to hang along the top deck and drops in to impress the judge with a big five four. Continuing with big hits, Sean has pulled out all the stops to try and catch the leader. 
And as he throws a final air fakey, yeah, he crosses the finish line. He's excited, and he takes a fall. The crowd loves it. Sean Johnson with 58.7 points. Not a bad run. All right, back to the top of the half pipe. Unknown rider Jason Evans from Vermont kicks out of the start for his final run of the day. He has been riding a strong, solid run all day, and this one looks to be no exception, pulling off an excellent 540. Spectators seem to be enjoying Jason's run. Let's take a look. All right, Jason throws a final elk air, and now he's performing a little nose discos. He crosses the finish with a 59.4. And as we take one last look at the crowd, let's see the final results in the women's competition. All right, in first place is Moro rider Jenna Mayan. In second place, Burton rider Kara Beth Burnside and Sims rider Shannon Dunn. For the men, it's Sims rider Jason Evans. In second place, newcomer Sean Johnson. And in third, Lamar rider Jimmy Scott. The most difficult thing for me is to keep on the speed you got in transition to get as high as possible, keep on your edge. Survival in a big air contest is the key to life. <laughs> feel like an eagle in the sky, something like that, <laughs> for a couple of seconds, not even seconds. Finishing the European leg of this season's ISF World Pro Tour, the world's top snowboarders crossed the Atlantic and descended down the slopes of Mount Saint Anne, Quebec. The season is winding down for the competitors as they battle for world ranking points and a share of the $60,000 prize money during this three discipline event. Mount St. Anne is the only Canadian stop on the Ballantyne World Pro Tour, but this beautiful ski resort never fails to provide some of the season's best competition. And why not? With its dramatic backdrop of the St. Lawrence Seaway, Mount St. Anne has over 50 trails catering to all levels of skiers. A quality half pipe, 30 snowboard trails and 2,000 vertical feet keeps these snowboarders coming back with smiles on their faces. 
And as we look down from the start of the dual slalom course, awaiting the semifinal runs, let's meet some of the top competitors. For the men, first it's Austria's Martin Frenanovich, the fastest qualifier. Next, it's Germany's veteran, Peter Bauer. Having a strong year, he's still looking for his first slalom victory. And no final draw would be complete without the king of consistency, Karl Heinz Zangerl. On into the women's final, Christine Rauter is looking to be the favorite, while Burton teammate Martina Magenta is hot on her heels. Looking up this demanding dual slalom course, we see the course crew doing their final preparation. First up is Austrian Karl Heinz Zangerl in the yellow course and Martin Frenonovitz in the red course. And what a heat this first semi promises to be. Karl Heinz Zangerl up against compatriot Martin Frenonovitz. These two Austrians have been at each other's heels all season, producing some of the year's most memorable races. Statistically, they're inseparable, each with an equal number of wins. But on this technical course, it looks like Zangrel on yellow may have the advantage. And as he continues down into the finish area, he has won the race, relieved to have beaten his arch rival. And with one semi left to run, Zangrel must be feeling confident, knowing that he's to face one of these men in the final. Neither Nicola Conte nor Dieter Morandel has made it through to a final this year, and both will be happy to get this heat over with. As Conte explodes out of the gate, he's judged to have clipped the inside of the first gate, and that mistake gives Morandel his first final appearance this year. But before that confrontation, though, Christine Rauter and Martina Magenta have to fight it out in the women's final. Best of friends off the course, these two Burton team riders will give their all in this final run, and as they hit the course, it's Router on yellow with an immediate advantage. With a desperate Magenta hot on her heels, Router has to keep pushing if she's to win here. As training partners, Router will know the determination of Magenta. And it can't be easy keeping focus. And it looks like there's no doubt who the winner will be as Router keeps her early lead blasting into the finish area to claim her second win of the season. And that leaves Magenta wondering just what does she have to do to win a parallel slalom against Router? And Router is delighted with her win. We caught up with her in the finish line. It's great, and it's the first Masters I win. I didn't expect this. I mean, I was fighting it, but I didn't uh, say, ah, maybe I win this race today. I just did it, and I'm really happy I could do it. And it's my my second World Cup race in Slalom my win this year. And uh, it's great. Okay, looking for his third Slalom win this year, Zangerl finds himself in yet another final, this time against the German rider, Moendahl. Zangerl has had the more difficult route to this final, having to beat the likes of Bauer and Frenonovic, so he must be feeling confident. Moendahl on the red hasn't raced a final this season. But he's putting up a tough fight as the riders make their way down the course. And as they hit the lower section, Mondo looks to be struggling in the heavy ruts while Zangrel has settled into his rhythmical style. The pace proves too hard for Mondo as he goes wide, heading off the course, and he's going to hand that victory to a delighted Zangrel. Zangrel picking up his third victory this season is a very happy guy as he consoles Dieter Mondel. We caught up with him in the finish line. Yesterday was very happy. I qualified for today in a fast way. And today, when I beat Martin, I know that I could win the race. So after 48 grueling final heats, the parallel slalom competition comes to a close here at Mount St. Anne, Canada. And for the women, it's a well-earned victory for Burton's Christine Rauter. Martina Magenta takes second, and Ariel Ray an excellent third. And in the men's slalom, Carl Heinz Zangerl claims yet another win, while Dieter Mondel takes a second place, and Martin Fernandemitz places third. The day of the Super G met the competitors with blue sky, and with the St. Lawrence Seaway as their backdrop, 
the competitors couldn't help but to be pumped up. And basically what we have today is bright sunshine, clear blue skies, and excellent visibility. And we didn't have any new snow overnight. The snowcats have been on the hill yesterday, prepared the hill before we started setting. And now we have almost ideal race conditions for a Super G today. So with everything looking good, it's the women who take to the course first with only one chance to set the fastest time. One of the first up riding in front of her home crowd is 24-year-old Canadian Victoria Jalous. Three-year pro Jalous has had a quiet season. A fourth place was her best result overall this year, but she'll be looking to impress here as she hits the bottom half of this long course and heads to the finish line. Tucking over the line, she set the target for the rest of the women, 108.62, putting her atop of the ranking so far. Para Master Pool is on the course next. This Cross M rider is really attacking the gates as she flies down the course on her way to a fast time. Tucking through the finish on a tight racing line, it's 110.31 for the American, giving her a third place finish. And after all 39 female competitors completed the course, no one could touch that early run, and Victoria Jalous takes first place racing on her home snow here at Mount St. Anne. Moving on to the men's Super G, a larger field of 79 riders will attack the same course as the women. First up is newly crowned European GS champion Martin Fernandemitz. The favorite going into this event, Martin is judged to have clipped the gate right there on his way down the course, resulting in an early upset as he exits the competition. On course next is 24-year-old American Mike Jacoby. He fell in the Super G competition at his home course in Mount Hood, Oregon. He's really going for it. And as he powers himself through the gates, carving a tight line towards the finish, he'll set a time of 103.21, the fastest time so far, giving him the lead with the rest of the men's field still to come. I uh, went for it. I really wanted it. Got out in some snow. snow. I don't know how it's going to cost me. I held my hand in the air a few times, but in general, I had a pretty good run. We'll see how it holds. You know, it's a super G. You never know. Jacoby's time did hold its own against the early runners, keeping him in first place until Canadian Ross Babagliotti set an electric pace on the first half of the course, threatening the American's time. And as he blasted down the home stretch, his time of 103.81 wasn't good enough to beat Jacoby, and he'll have to settle for second place. Back to the top of the course, we have 27-year-old Austrian Jerry Ring blistering the top half of the course, and he seems to be on track for a fast result. But at 104.35, it's only good enough for third place, and Jacoby holds on to first position. And as the Super G discipline at this Mount St. Anne Masters event comes to a close, Mike Jacoby picks up his first win of the season, but with a win in the women's and second place in the men, it's an excellent day for the home racers. Victoria Jalous of Canada in first, Betsy Shaw of the United States, and Tara Masterpool rounding out second and third. For the men, it's Mike Jacoby of the USA, and in second place, Ross Rabagliati of Canada, and in third, Jerry Ring of Austria. Next up is the high-flying half-pipe competition. With 16 men making it to the final round, and it's Terje Hawkinson who leads the men, followed by overall leader Bertrand Denerod, who's still looking for his first half-pipe victory. American Jimmy Scott is making a strong bid for today's title. In the women's competition, it's European champion Nicole Engraff, making it easily into the final, while right behind her is American Shannon Dunn. Jumping straight off into the pipe with an impressive 540 is Tina Basich, picking up some early points before pulling off a series of front and rear rail grabs to impress the team of international judges. With the last two runs counting, Tina needed a great run to maintain her lead, but with two riders left, anything can happen. Holding second place going into this final run is fellow American Shannon Dunn and she's set to try to overtake Basich 
needing a score of 114 or more to put her into the lead. Dropping into the pipe, this 21-year-old pro hits the coping with two backside grabs before launching into this big 540 spin, picking up valuable points halfway down the pipe. Winner of the Women's Pro Half Pipe title two years ago, Shannon is showing why she is still a force to reckon with. Completing her run with style, Shannon Dunn picks up enough points to take over the lead with only one rider to go. Next up is newly crowned European champion, Nicole Angeroff. But Nicole has a disappointing second run and only picks up enough points to secure third place. So that leaves Shannon Dunn the winner and Tina Bassett an impressive second place. And it's on to the men and Swiss rider Bertrand Denerod. Bertie is still looking to pick up his first half fight victory. And currently sitting in second place, he begins with a series of big hits that not only impresses the judges, but also the big Canadian crowd. With a second run score of 186 points, Denerod takes the lead and is excited with his run, getting a high five from the crowd. Finland's Sibu Kohlberg is not able to take over the lead, even with this big backside air. Sibu stands and waits as the final riders drop into the pipe. Needing just 178 points to win, Terje Hawkinson is the last rider to enter the pipe. But despite huge jumps like these, Terje cannot collect enough points to oust Venervod from his lead, leaving Hawkinson in second, two points behind the excited Swiss rider. And that completes the half-pipe competition for Mount St. Anne, with Shannon Dunn leading the women, followed by Tina Basich and Nicole Engelroth. And in first place for the men, Bertrand Denervad of Switzerland, followed by Terje Hawkinson of Norway and Sibu Kuberg of Finland. The next stop on the Ballantine's ISF World Pro Tour was held in Hunter Mountain in upstate New York. This two discipline event featured a very demanding dual slalom course and a half pipe competition world ranking points became more critical to obtain as there were several world titles yet to be crowned. The weather did not cooperate greeting the competitors with rain during the dual slalom and six inches of snow for the half pipe. Full commitment was necessary to endure the poor weather conditions and route to victory. And as we get a racer's perspective at the top of the slalom course, this is the first of the two men's semis. And it's a psyched up Bertrand Denerod going up against America's Mike Jacoby. And charging out onto the course, they get an even start and they fight for that extra advantage that could mean the difference once they hit the line. But with both riders on superb form, this is parallel slalom at its best. Two top riders blasting down the course, neck and neck, neither one giving an inch as they power through the slalom gate. Dropping into the lower section, it's impossible to separate them. This and really is a close heat. And as they near the finish, it's anyone's guess. And it's Denervod edging out Mike Jacoby. Back up to the top, it's slalom star Hans Roche against the determined Jerry Ring. And onto the course, it's Roche on red. Getting an excellent start, blasting his way down the run, but on the difficult course, it's an incredible double disaster as both riders lose their grip, almost colliding in a spectacular crash. Both riders are trying to get back on the course, ring on yellow, making it up to the correct gate. He's resuming the race ahead of his opponent. So with the tables turned, Jerry Ring takes over the lead, powering his way down the course, closely followed by the charging road. But after one of the more bizarre heats of this contest, it's a delighted ring who makes it through, taking up that place in the final against Mike Jacoby. And it's back up to the top here at Hunter Mountain for the finals for the women's competition. Christina Rauter of Austria against her teammate Martina Magenta of Italy. Rauter on the yellow has the psychological advantage here after beating Magenta last week. Magenta, however, is still looking for her first fall win this year. And she's as determined as ever to beat the strong Austria. 
halfway down the course. It looks like Magenta has the slight advantage, almost a kid ahead of Router. But as we've seen so often this year, Magenta just doesn't seem to be able to hold the lead, popping out of the heavily rutted course and handing yet another win to Router. So it's despair for the Italian as Christine Router powers home to another convincing win, her second in as many contests, a fact she must be well pleased with. Christine Router, number one here at Hunter. We had a chance to talk with her in the finish line. Let's hear what she had to say. Really difficult. There were big, big holes and rats, and underneath it was icy. So whether you were in the hole or you were on the rats on the ice, so you had to fight from the top till the bottom. Only the last few gates you could let the board run and you could fight. And in these conditions, it's, it's really difficult for everybody. And still to face these tough conditions, Jerry Ring of Austria going into the final against Bert Dennervad of Switzerland. After start gate troubles towards the end of the competition, the races are run on an elapsed time basis. So as Ring fires out from his start gate, Dennervad decides to wait a few seconds before beginning his run. A tactical move. Dennervad hopes to be able to run his course while still having Ring in his sights on the other course. But it doesn't work out for the Swiss rider as he struggles in the heavy ruts while Ring appears to be setting a fast time. Obviously, Dennervad makes a final error that sees him slip from the course. He missed the gate, and he hands Jerry Ring his first slalom win of the season. Let's find out what happened to Dennervad. It was a tough course, so you had to have 10 runs without mistakes from the morning. We started early this morning. It's late now, so it's a long day. You have to stay concentrated for six hours and stay consistent. So consistency paid today. Finally, <laughs> the whole season I had a little, not too much luck, but the last race here in the season was a quite good race for me. Uh -huh. The conditions were really, really difficult here, and I had a pretty solid runs, and it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> And that about wraps up the competition here at Hunter Mountain. For the women in first place, Christine Rauter of Austria edging out her teammate Martina Magenta from Italy. And in third place, Anja Hagenbucher of Germany. And for the men, it's Jerry Ring of Austria coming in first over Bertrand Dennervad of Switzerland. And in third place from Germany, Hans Roche. Welcome back to the competition here at Hunter Mountain. What's up next? The half pipe. And who are we going to watch for? Bertrand Dennervad from Switzerland. He should be very tough to beat here at Hunter Mountain. Another European, Johan Olofsson from Sweden. He's been making a name for himself this year and performing very well. For the women, watch for Michelle Tagger. She has been very strong in all events, all season long. Part of a strong European field, Nikki Fischer of Germany will be looking for a good result as well. All right, let's go to the Hunter Mountain half pipe. Up to the top and first up to the women. German half pipe specialist, Sandra Farman. She's currently in second place, and she'll need some huge air to take over the lead. Unfortunately, the pipe is very icy, and it did not permit Farming to perform her best trick. Looking very comfortable in the half pipe is Michelle Taggart, and she shows why she was always a top contender in the half pipe. Taggart currently on top, yeah. having a great yeah. run. Yeah, now a little bit of problems there near the finish, but she still leads the women with a total point accumulation of 205. And what were Michelle's thoughts for the day? Let's find out. I wouldn't want to be a judge today. I think it would have been really hard to judge, judge this pipe because everyone, nobody could really do their best in it. You just kind of had to hold on and survive. So that's what I did. And now it's on to the men's competition here at Hunter Mountain, where there was a depleted field of entrants competing in a wide windblown pipe. On course now is Norwegian Jorgen Novak making an early impression on the judges. On course now is Sweden's Ingmar Backman jumping his way into the top spot with a series of three moves.
ending with a beautiful 720 to give him the lead. Johan Olofsson from Sweden then hit the pipe, determined to take advantage of the lack of big names here at Hunter Mountain. Due to the small field of entrants, judges and competitors agreed to a change in the usual format. Beautiful 720. Instead, each rider was given three runs down the pipe. His highest two scores would then be combined to give the result. In his first run, Olofsson picked up the highest score. And by the end of his third run was first place with just one rider left. But with Bertrand Dennervad dropping in, that lead was never safe. Bertrand, as the highest ranked competitor there, was always the favorite to win. And pulling big air like this in a pipe of this condition, it's no wonder. Dennervad been around the top places in the half pipe all season, as well as picking up victories in parallel songs, showing why he's set to keep his World Pro Tour overall title for yet another season. He picks up another half pipe victory here, proving to us all that he really is a dedicated all-rounder. We had a chance to talk with him. Let's hear what he had to say. The pipe was not really good here. We had some really warm weather yesterday, so the pipe melted, and today it snowed inside, so the pipe was really in bad condition. So the show was not really good, unfortunately, and so, but it was a competition. It's always good to win, though. And that about wraps up the competition here at Hunter Mountain for the half pipe. Let's take a look at the results. For the women, Michelle Taggart comes in first, beating out Sandra Farman of Germany and Christy Elder of the United States. In first place for the men, Bertrand Dennervard of Switzerland, beating out Johan Olofsson and Ingemar Backman, both of Sweden. No professional sports tour would be possible without a grassroots program to introduce the younger competitors to the sport, and snowboarding is no exception. The United States Amateur Snowboarding Association was formed several years ago to help promote local racing and train future professional snowboarders. This year, the national competition was held at Sierra at Tahoe in California, where there were three competitors that stood above the rest. Let's take a look at Stacia Hookham, Sean White, a young seven-year-old that will blow your mind, and Steve Persons, stepbrother to Olympic gold medalist Tommy Moe. Famous for the nightlife, South Lake Tahoe has fantastic skiing at its back door. But this week, it was the snowboarders' turn to take over the town. The United States Amateur Snowboarding Association held their national championships here. Hundreds of amateur snowboarders converged to compete in alpine and half-pipe contests at Sierra Tahoe Ski Resort. Well, this is the slope-style venue of the uh, USASA National Amateur Championships. It's a brand new venue that uh, we're seeing our regions all around the country get involved with. Uh, there's the term jib and bonk and what all, and that's kind of working the terrain as you see it, getting out into the trees, having some fun with the mountain as it is. And so you'll see in the background here some different hits that the riders are taking. Uh, they're able, to, it's a freestyle venue, so they do whatever they want. They are trying to impress five judges down below. Person's racing career started fast, competing not on a snowboard, but on skis. Made the switch because I thought snowboarding was a lot of fun. Started about six years ago and uh, just something new to try. I liked it. Snowboarding is so, such a new sport that the technology is changing so fast that um, it makes a difference compared to the skiing because people have been skiing for so long. So snowboarding is a little bit more difficult, I think. Making the switch to snowboarding has proven to be beneficial to Steve as he is seen streaking down the GS course to a second place victory overall. Yeah, I felt, it felt pretty good. I was, had a really fast top and then I knew I had to push it on the bottom so, and it felt real smooth on the bottom so I just went for it, tried to stay inside the rut. Stacia Hookham has competed in many pro events, but she remains an amateur in hopes of making the Olympics. I kind of prefer the pro races because there's a lot more women that I have to run after and they make me go faster. I can't, you know, I can't screw up at all in order to do well amongst them. But it's a lot of fun to do these races too because uh, it kind of lets you know that you're still a strong rider because sometimes, sometimes the pros can just beat you so bad that that it's not as much fun as winning, I guess. The experience she received 
the professional races proved beneficial as Stacia wins the GS competition as well as the slalom and took top alpine on. There's a lot of young talent competing here in Sierra Tahoe, and another young star is 17-year-old Ian Price. I'd like to stay amateur and see how the Olympics are going to turn out for snowboarding and see if they're going to allow snowboarding in. If they do, I'd like to try and make it in there. It's going to be pretty stiff competition to try to get in because there's so many good amateurs out there. But uh, I'd like to stay amateur, and if that doesn't work out, maybe I'll go pro, but I'll probably end up just staying amateur. Don't go away, we'll be right back with more snowboarding. about wraps up all the action here from the North American ISF Valentine's World Pro Snowboarding Tour. We'll see you next time.